algorithm updates. Welcome everybody to the PIES committee meeting for May 20 something, 21st. Second. 22nd, excellent. Uh, PIES, Public Infrastructure, Environment and Sustainability. So we're gonna start with a approval of the minutes. Could I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Okay. Um, Council President will be along shortly. And uh, Council Member Bingle, you're online. So Jacoby's going to make sure that if you have a question, he will alert me because there's a lot that's going on. We're going to move up a consent item, which is the streets automated pavement assessment for discussion. We'll do that first. Is there someone here to talk about it? Great. Clint, welcome. 4.3. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, the street department's requesting approval for an amendment and renewal of a contract with Transmap to collect automated pavement assessment and sidewalk infill data. The pavement assessment data is at a cost of $60,240.93 and the sidewalk data collection is at a cost of $37,273. Or $37,273. Uh, the Transmap's original contract award was uh, via an RFQ, and uh, this is an extension that will provide uh, information for uh, sidewalk infill is, is the purpose of adding on the uh, additional uh, request. Questions? Go ahead. Just curious, does it generate, uh, kind of as the name implies, a, a map that shows the quality of the roadways throughout the entire city? Mm -hmm. That's what we're using for our pavement assessment currently. And is there, and so this, this add-on, is this just to do the sidewalk or is there additional other pieces? To do the sidewalk uh, along the uh, arterials and the ADA ramps. And okay. that will help to give us an inventory of what we currently would have installed and what would need to be installed. Would it be, would it be possible for us to get a copy of the map as it exists now? Uh, well, the information would have to be gathered for the sidewalks. Is that what you're requesting? Well, for, for what we have now not including the sidewalks uh yeah i think i could probably provide that okay that'd be great okay thank you all right next up eldon we're going to talk about vacation of the alley between fourth and fifth good afternoon council we have an applicant who wants to vacate the alley between fourth and fifth from Boyston to bernard on the east half of that alley, basically on both sides, the applicant wants to build a 210 unit multifamily housing complex and would go across the alley. That's part of the reason for the vacation. Uh, the city does not have any utilities in that alley, but there is a private sewer on the west side there that would have to be protected with an easement. One of the things we do have that's an issue is with refuse on there since Weston Street's one way going south down the hill or excuse me, north down the hill, and Bernard's two-way on there. If we close the alley off at the east end, that means refuse has got to get in there and then get back out. So we need a turnaround inside there. So they, we've had some meetings with the applicants that presently use refuse on both sides of that alley. And I think we're coming along with a, an actual uh, program to make that work, let's put it that way. But that's one of the key considerations we'd want to have done before we do a final reading of that vacation to make sure we have that result. It is going to be $110,000. That's the assessed value for vacating that alley. Uh, I think that's pretty much most of the issues we have. I think we got a Vista, uh, Lumen, and uh, let's see, and Comcast one to reserve easements potentially in there. And our goal would be to see if we can work the issues out to where we can relocate them or whatever without retaining those easements. But if we do retain them, we certainly can work with them to actually get rid of them as they figure out how they can eliminate them through the process. So that's pretty much the issues with that one. Be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Eldon. Just on the garbage truck, because I have garbage truck issues myself. 
So there would be a turnaround just halfway through the alley? Yes, right in front of the actual new structure they're going to build. We've been working with the applicants that own property on the west side of where the structure is going to be, right in that area where I've got the hand. Okay. We're going to be working as far as coming up with an actual turnaround access in there because there's no way they can back out into no. Weston Street. No. But we've had a meeting with everybody involved with that, and I think we're working to a solution to that problem. Right. Thank you, Eldon. Anybody else? <clears throat> Thank you, Eldon. Thanks. Next up is a GFC monthly update. Marlene, are you going to? Great. Thank you. Yep, it's me. Hey, Marlene, could you share that into the WebEx so that Councilmember Bingle can see it? Okay. So I can do that on my end here for you. You can do it. Can I do it as a slideshow too? Yeah. Okay. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a quick update on um, the GFC um, education process and, and uh, work that we're doing on the outreach. So um, since we were here in April, we have appointed members to the mayor's GFC committee. Our first meeting was held on May 11th. We've scheduled meetings every other Thursday through June. Um, we've also began work toward the additional outreach that was anticipated. Um, so we have reached out to the liaisons um, to the sustainability, sustainability Action Subcommittee, the Equity Subcommittee, and the Housing Action Subcommittee. We're scheduled um, on June 6th to present to the Sustainability Action Subcommittee, and I'm working on the assessment document required for um, appearances at the other two committees. Um, we're continuing our email outreach to a broader group of stakeholders. The last email that went out was on May 15th. And we are continuing to update information on the city's website, including these new great FAQs that Kirsten is going to email to you this afternoon um, that could be helpful for folks who may not be as versed in um, general facilities charges. Um, we also have um, the recording from the first from the first meeting um, there and have sent that also to the committee members if they were unable to attend, they have that access. Um, and as you know, of course, we did adopt, council adopted uh, the change to the SMC that removes the specific meter sizes for duplexes and triplexes that happened last week. Here's just the list of folks who are on um, the review committee. So a good cross section um, of uh, you know, commercial developers, residential developers, low-income housing developers, Council Member Kinnear and Council Member Bingle, of course, have joined us as well. Um, and Planning Commission is there and FutureWise and Downtown Spokane Partnership. So kind of a nice mix of um, different groups um, represented there to get a lot of perspectives. And of course, those meetings are all open to the public if anyone wants to join us. They're held um, in person in room TB, but also as a hybrid option um, through a Teams meeting. Um, these are the things on our May 11th meeting, we talked to the committee about what they wanted to talk about, if that makes sense. We went over the basics and kind of where we were. Um, the, the next meeting will have those two red items as our um, discussion points, which is understanding the calculation. There's questions about interest, original project costs, um, determining new capacity, um, the one inch base or a three quarter inch base for those charges. So those are kinds of things we'll be going over there. And then we're gonna talk about, um, the, we have obviously in the, what's adopted by city council is two zones um, on the water GFC side, but that's something that they wanna look at. Um, what could it look like two zones or one? So we'll have those discussions. And then um, for future meetings, we have sort of this growth versus rights discussion. Um, what we should be supporting in terms of economic development with um, waivers or deferrals of GFCs. And then we'll get into this um, concept around methodology. There's a lot of question around MCEs versus equivalent residential units. So we'll have that discussion and that could be something that they took a look at. Um, they also wanted to take a look at, a uh, fresh look at phase-in approaches, so we'll do that. The other two items will kind of be incorporated into those things. There wasn't as much interest in those, but still some. So growth protections and capital planning. Um, we have given all of the members access to um, all the, the, the lists of assets already in the system and then the future projects that are anticipated. So they can kind of already be reviewing that and ask questions about how that works. So um, that's where that is, and that's where we are. 
questions, questions for Marlene? Um, Mr. Bingle, do you have any questions? Not right now, no. Okay, good. Thank, All right. thank you. Marlene, thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Marlene. <clears throat> okay, next up is Mr. Gardner with Plan Commission Work Program Resolution. <coughs> Hello, Council. Um, this is sort of following on from what Marlene just presented. Uh, we, at the end of last year, adopted a work program for Plan Commission. Council adopted that. Um, there have been some new needs that have arisen in this year for Plan Commission to have some items added. And so this would be a resolution to add two items to Plan Commission's work program. The first is related to GFCs. When those were adopted, Council also adopted a resolution at the same time that expressed a desire for Plan Commission to um, have an opportunity to review the proposed changes as a result of the, um, the outreach and the work that Marlene and her team are doing. So this would add the GFCs formally to Plan Commission's work program. The other is a, um, a change, potential change to the Shoreline Master Plan um, and the code that, that um, governs what you can do in the shoreline. This is in response to a request from the Coeur d'Alene tribe who is interested in looking at a fish hatchery on, um, on the river. And so we have to do some work in our code to evaluate, um, we don't, we don't, it, when we updated that code originally, the topic of a fishery, a fish hatchery was not really something that we were considering, and so it's just not really addressed in the code very well. So we need to update the code. We are working with the Coeur d'Alene tribe on their um, desire to do the fish hatchery, but this is something that would also need to be added to Plan Commission's um, work plan. So those are the two items, and these would just come as a resolution to you. What's your timeline? For the fish hatchery? For both the resolution. Oh, for the resolution? Um, I mean, the resolution language is in there, and uh, I think it would be just as quickly as we can get it through. There's okay. no rush, but um, there's nothing okay. we need to wait for. Okay. Just how is your, how is your uh, existing capacity, and, and what items, if any, will get kind of pushed down the, the list? So the, um, for the GFCs, this doesn't really affect our capacity all that much because this is Marlene's team that's really doing a lot of the work. It's really just opening up space for Plan Commission to include that. Our, our plan is actually to hold a couple of special meetings of the Plan Commission so that it doesn't take away from their, their regular workload that we have them working through during the year. Um, on the Shoreline one, uh, we, I think we have enough capacity that we can take that one on. So Tyrrell Black is heading that up. And uh, I, I think it'll mostly just be her that needs to be uh, focusing on that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. MFTE conditional agreements amendment GFCs. Seems to be a theme. Good afternoon, Council. So these will be minor contract amendments to previously approved 12-year MFTE contracts. Um, these are ones that have not submitted for their water or wastewater permits. Um, full intent as the GFCs were being moved through that ordinance update. Staff is still working on those contractual agreements that Council has already approved. Um, so we've worked with the legal department to put in new language that will go in an amended contract that just states they um, can apply for the new GFC water and wastewater uh, waiver and then they would have to maintain their 12 year compliance. Otherwise, it'll have that clawback that has been put into the new GFC ordinance. Questions, go ahead. And just full, everybody who's kind of falling under this new language, they, they understand the changes and they've been fully briefed yes. on that. Yes, so we've reached out to all of the applicants and then because it's amending the contract, they'll need to re-sign, so they'll be aware of the language as well. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Thank you. Next up, Federal Safe Streets for All grant with Marcia Davis and Inga or just Inga? Is it already shared? It's not. It's not. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Here we go. All right, good afternoon, Council. So I'm back to talk to you about the Safe Streets for All program. Um, the um, the NOFO, which is the, the notice of the federal funding availability, came out recently. And um, there's going to be up to, um, quite a bit of money available this year. I don't have the exact amount up there. But um, we are looking at doing an implementation grant. Um, SRTC last year put in for a regional action plan grant, which we are a participant in. But since we already had the makings of our own action plan grant, we're finalizing that in-house and then just moving forward with an implementation grant without waiting for everybody else. So um, these are due in uh, beginning of July. And um, the minimum award this year is 2.5 million. They dropped it down a little bit. And there's a 20% a match requirement. So what we're able to do for our action plan, which is required to have it in place and publicly available by the end of June, um, we've taken the work that's been done on our downtown plan because it had a pretty extensive public outreach and some um, crash analysis as part of it. We've got um, our bike network map and then we've got the local road safety assessment that I've done every couple years as a support document for some other safety grants. And so we're kind of combining those all together. Mm -hmm. This is an effort that I'm working on with planning to, to make um, an action plan that will be eligible for this program. So um, there are certain elements we have to meet. We should meet all of these. These are the required ones. And then four of these, we have to have at least four of these. Uh, one of them is adopting a Vision Zero resolution, which Council did, I think, last fall. So it's good that we have that done and on the books because that'll be helpful. So what we're looking at, um, our crash data shows, and this is pretty small, but um, the part that's red there is showing you the number of vulnerable user collisions, which is pedestrian and bike collisions that have happened in the past five years that resulted either in fatalities or serious injuries. And it's um, basically the statistic is showing you that we had 176 of those collisions and that they made up 39% of all fatal and serious crashes in the city. So 39% involved either a bike or a ped. So we're trying to focus our application on reducing that number. So that's what you'll see reflected in here. These are just some of the other statistics. 23% um, of them occurred at arterial traffic signals. 58% occurred at arterial intersections, which could be a stop control or, or a signal. 40% um, of the bike collisions occurred on arterial road segments. So that gives you an idea of what we're trying to target, which is um, intersections on arterials and arterial road segments. And then these we pulled, I think, out of the downtown plan, um, or at least the data is specifically to the downtown area, that we have um, some other stats that just show that more than half of them were intersection related, a lot of them were speed related, um, a surprising number was a pedestrian using a marked crosswalk, and then um, some were crossing in a location without a signal. So these are all just contributing factors that we look at. So um, I'm gonna show you what Seattle turned in last year because they got a, a very large amount of money. Um, they turned in an application where they focused on doing very similar types of projects. They were doing signalized intersection treatments which included leading pedestrian intervals installing the accessible push buttons. These are the ones that we have outside of City Hall that talk to you. Um, the, uh, they updated ADA ramps. They put in protected bike lanes, sidewalk infill, arterial traffic calming, and then a bunch of unsignalized pedestrian crossing treatments. They requested $37.5 million for this, and they were awarded $25 million. So because they were successful, we're kind of copying what they did. Um, and this is the, the project area that we're 
we're working on right now. It might be tweaked a little bit in the next month, but we're trying to focus on downtown and then the area that's like just on the outskirts of the downtown where we think we'll get more people that are likely to um, walk or bike to transit or into the downtown core. Which area closest? To so everything that's in the red boundary up here. So um, okay. neighborhood-wise, we're looking at okay. West Central, Brown's Edition, Peaceful Valley, um, a good chunk of okay. East Central, some of Logan. So there's, there's okay. quite a bit in there. It's, it's just a little hard to see. It, it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And um, I know it's very hard to make out the green shading in there, but um, one of the goals for this program, the government wants to put a very large percent of it into what they call underserved community census tracts. So our boundary is drawn around census tract boundaries instead of neighborhood council boundaries. Um, and all of them except one area is green and considered underserved community, which will be helpful. So this is what we're looking at, um, similar to Seattle, looking at doing installing more of these accessible PED signals because we don't have a lot of them, especially in the downtown. Um, we'd like to, to turn on leading pedestrian intervals, which may require some controller switch outs and modifying some timing plans yet. We, we haven't figured out all the details on that one. Um, we'd like to upgrade some of the crosswalks that are signals from the old parallel lines to the piano key style, which wear better and are more visible. Um, there may be a few more spots where we'd like to do the green bike lane extensions through intersections. ADA ramps, we have a lot of places in the project area that need this. There's a few spots in the downtown and surrounding areas that are still missing arterial sidewalks, so trying to capture some of those. And then there may be some spots where we could do rapid flash beacon or even a pet hybrid beacon. And I'm still working on identifying exactly where. So those would be done in kind of a, a systemic treatment where I would have a, a list in the application of potential locations, but we wouldn't finalize it until afterwards and probably work with the PC PCTS and the neighborhood councils to figure out which locations. But then we also have some specific projects that we want to include. Um, so the purple shows you that some of them that we're considering. There's still a couple others that um, are in the works, but I'll go through a few of them. Um, Iron Bridge Pathway, we'd like to build this connection. Once the, the Trent Bridge opens back up, we can get under there and, and pave the pathway and connect from the Trent Bridge up to Iron Bridge and also close that little gap down to the south that will connect it to Ben Burr and complete the trail on that side of the river. Uh, the Maple Street Toll Plaza, um, I was trying to put a couple of stairway projects in here because we don't have really any dedicated funds to maintaining our city stairways. And I realized when I went out to look at this one that you can, if you're in a wheelchair or you're in a, you know, going on your bike, you can get on the Maple Street Bridge from the south side but you can't get off it on the north side because all you have is a stairway. There's no accessible route out. So looking at adding something here to make it so that you can get up off the, off the bridge. 14th Avenue, um, this is an, another stairway that's really in bad shape. And so I, I'd like to see if we could upgrade this one, which would include you know rebuilding the stairway, the pathway in between, putting bike rentals on it. And then at the same time, fill in the sidewalk that's missing on Perry because there's several blocks up there that don't have any sidewalk. And then we pulled some projects out of the downtown plan, which had gone through a pretty extensive public involvement. Um, two of them are doing bike lanes on First and Sprague Avenues, and these would run from basically the west end of downtown by the fire station all the way over to... Washington Stevens and maybe actually probably closer to the um, the train station I think to the intermodal center would be approximately the east end and this would require taking away one of the travel lanes and creating a buffered bike lane so that was first this is Sprague we're still trying to work out the nuances on this one as to what side of the street it goes on because we want to avoid the STA Plaza, but then the CCL stops 
at the west end do not have room for the bike lane to go behind, so we might have to swap the bike lane to the other side of the street. So. We're also looking at doing parts of Washington and Stevens. So um, from Fifth to Sprague is what I'm showing you on the image here. We've got four lanes through all of that, and that could easily be downsized to three. There was some discussion in the downtown plan about going all the way to Spokane Falls Boulevard, and we're still looking into whether that's something we think we could do with this application or not. So um, there are a few others that we're working on, but just, just to give you an idea, this is, this is kind of what the application would look like. We would have a mix of specific corridor projects that'll have a fixed dollar amount, and then we'll have a mix of systemic projects where we'll just build a certain amount depending how much money they give us. And the range that we're looking for the total project cost is somewhere in the five to 12 million, which is a big range, um, and we're still working on the cost estimates and trying to figure out what we can reasonably get done with staff and what we have for available match, because it is a 20% match. Okay. Yes. Oh, wait. Okay. Council Member Bingle, go ahead. Thank you, Inga. Um, so that means we have three bike ped vehicle accidents a month. Is that what I was what I was what I was hearing? Based on the, the number one hundred and seventy six five years? Yeah. That that's not just bike ped, those are the ones that are fatal or serious collisions. So that's not even all of the ones, that's just the what that are fatal or serious. Over five years, yes, that's a five-year wow. number. Wow, wow. Um, and then my last question is um, on the uh, on the grant area, that target area there, is that going to uh, work in our favor in any way with our uh, transit-oriented development work that we're doing in, in similar areas? It, it could certainly with the Logan area, yeah, because part of that is um, is included, I think, in this boundary. I'll have to check and see where the overlap is. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah. Could you, what were the boundaries on the map on the east, on the east side? I was just trying to see and I can't quite see from this angle. And then um, also, if you've got a list of those projects um, prioritized, I'd love to just kind of see what that prioritized list looks like. I, I'm working on the list still. So okay. I have parts of it and it's not prioritized whatsoever. Um, so the, let's see, where are we? I think the east boundary is Havana, maybe? Is it Havana? The on far the east? east one. Okay. And so is that following, is that Illinois on the north? Is that what that's following? It follows the river right here is oh, the, river. the river. Okay. Yeah, so it includes Chief Gary right here. Yeah. This would be SCC right here. Okay. And then going across the river, it gets into Logan. So, so most of Logan and most of Chief Gary, it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Do, leave that up for a sec, if you don't mind. What's that finger on the right top left of the map? Right top left. What is that? Left. Oh, left. Sorry. Yeah. That's, um, you know, it's just the census tract boundary, the way it's drawn. I okay. think. I think that's Doomsday Hill. I believe this is TJ Minock right okay. here. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Inga? Uh, I had a question. I was noticing a lot of those projects were like in the central downtown corridor, mm -hmm. but it looked like the potential area could expand more up into the neighborhoods. I, had there been discussion about trying to hit more like Chief Gary Park, West Central, and trying to connect them to downtown instead of like mm -hmm. multiple parallel tracks across downtown? that aren't leading out to the neighborhoods where people can <clears throat> connect, I guess. If you can elaborate on that idea. It, it's still a work in progress, and uh -huh. I'm trying to get it as much as I can done in the next month when it's due. So we kind of started with the ones that had been already discussed with the community, which were the, the stuff out of the downtown plan, and now I'm trying to expand it a little bit. Um, uh -huh. Like this morning, I was working on looking at where we need ADA ramps, and that was looking at all of those uh -huh. locations. Right. So it will expand out. It just we're not quite there it's yet. Not, yeah. One in particular, I think, is the Riverside connect the bike lane connecting to Brown's Edition. So just looking at 
those bike lanes and how to connect them to more residential areas so people can mm -hmm. feel more comfortable accessing them, I guess. The, the first and Sprague bike lanes do go mm. all the way over to Maple Street, just to the west of the fire station. Okay. So that would so that close that. a gap there. Yeah. Councilmember Cathcart. Is this limited to capital uh, projects then? We are probably going to have a little component that is um, some additional planning work and might be something like updating some of our standards to include, um, I guess, like different types of bike lane designs in our standard plans, things like that. We're, we're still working through that as okay. well. How about maintenance? Maintenance, no. No, okay. No. But I, I think, in a sense, you know, if you're looking at some of the crosswalks that we're replacing with more durable materials and the ADA ramps, it is something that sometimes our maintenance dollars end up covering that we'd be handling with us. I was, I was thinking more, you know, we're looking at perhaps buying some equipment to help maintain the, the bike lane, the, the protected bike lanes, and I wondered if that would maybe be something that could be included under this. It, it can, yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Inga? Thank you. All right, thank Appreciate you. it. Monsanto settlement update, Marsha Davis. Good afternoon. I'm here to talk about the funding part of the settlement of this um, Monsanto. I'm not here to discuss anything legal. This is my disclaimer. And our legal counsel, Elizabeth um, Chodel, is on vacation. So um, as, as you probably are aware, um, the city was awarded in a class action settlement, a nationwide from Monsanto, $6.7 million. And we committed, the city committed to use that money on stormwater projects to um, remove PCBs from our stormwater system and to clean the river and to, for, to, to avoid those to go into the Spokane River. So Cochrane Basin is the basin we identified when we were doing the integrated clean water plan as being a large contributor to the river of pollutants. And we began working on that. Um, our goal at that point was to get funding from the state or federal to pay for this project. We were not successful in getting a single funding package. And for um, what was available is um, the state of Washington has stormwater grants that come in a $5 million package. So we've divided up Cochrane Basin into six, six or seven different phases. We've gotten six, six different grants. These grants all had a 25% match. So the total project for Cochrane Basin, you can see on the slide there, $28 million is what we've come up with. We've received grants for about 16 million, and that leaves about 12 million that uh, the city is, is uh, paying for ourselves, paying uh, our, our obligation. So this work that we're doing for Cochrane Basin is, you could consider voluntary. We are not required by any mandate or regula regulation at this time to remove from the river. And this was the basis of our uh, settlement with Monsanto of, as we looked at historic ways that PCBs entered the river. In addition, there's a possibility to receive more funding in two other, um, two other parts, part A and B. We, have, we don't know the timing or how much money we will get, but we want to be prepared if that money comes so we have a list here of projects that we are considering that are in the same light of Cochrane Basin, that they're stormwater projects or the projects that PCBs um, we want to remove before they go to the river. One is Washington Basin. Washington Basin is another one of our very large stormwater basins. We've done a little bit of the work for Washington to remove that from the pipe that goes to the river along with that Monroe Street project. Uh, we've gotten some grants and we've spent about, uh, our match on that has been about $800, $830,000. Right now we're doing some planning. We've started our planning to do the full Washington Basin removal. Uh, so it would be similar to Cochrane Basin that we'd removing most of the stormwater that goes to the river. Um, so we don't have an idea how much that project will cost. We don't know what exactly the facilities would be. 
but it is an urban environment. It will be more expensive than Cochrane Basin. Another project that we've identified is Rifle Club, Club Road. We have a stormwater pipe that goes down Rifle Club right directly into the river. And um, we identified with another project that we could do an integrated project and remove the stormwater. And another concern we have is the biosolids. That's what's left over at the treatment plant that right now we spread on, um, on agricultural field, fields. There's a concern in the future, so we may not be able to do that. And there are many more. As part of our damages model um, that we submitted as part of this lawsuit, we came up with $25 million of projects that we'd already completed, uh, stormwater projects, and our estimate for the future was about a billion dollars. So um, we have a lot of ways that we'll need to prioritize any more money that comes in from Monsanto. Do we have any? Um, yes. Any questions? Uh, I'm going to respond to Councilmember Bingle. Can you hold on until we're finished with this topic? And Inga, please don't leave. Apparently, he has other questions for you. Um, any questions for Marsha? I have one. Are there any plans or any way we can prevent PCBs from getting into stormwater in the first place? So, in other words, are we taking proactive steps to keep PCBs out of the stormwater by identifying where they originate and then eliminating them at the source? Well, the city has been participating in projects like that. The source control with the uh, toxic task force, we've done, we did a lot of that testing in the past to find out what, what products actually are producing PCBs. Um, and I think there's been some legislation that we, you know, we've supported to do that. As a city it's ourselves, we're limited on what we can do and what we can say you can't use because the watershed is bigger than our city boundaries. Yeah. Plus, there's a lot of historic things that have been, you know, that store in the stormwater system itself that um, we don't we don't have control over what's there now. But there has been, we have participated in those programs, that source control program. Mm -hmm. um, I think the stormwater could, uh, uh, Trey George could probably give you a better idea of what exactly steps we have done. Okay. It's, yeah, I just think that your prevention is always going to be more efficient and cheaper than trying to correct it after it's yes, in the system. Yes, it, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Marsha. Um, Inga, could... Jonathan. Jonathan's changed his mind. It was my okay. Thank you in advance for almost coming up. Next step is Unpaved Streets Program. With Kevin. Welcome. Good afternoon. Is this shared? Yet? Is it? Okay, great. So, good afternoon. Um, I was asked to present today on our unpaved streets program, just give you a, a brief update of where we stand. We do have a study session scheduled for next uh, June 1st, next uh, week from Thursday. So, it's just a real quick overview. Um, just give a quick background and, and history update. Um, show the locations completed to date as well as the locations um, planned here for 2023. And then you see a list of sort of agenda items, if you will, that I intend to dive into for the June 1st study session. I'll come back to this at the end, so I hope that if there's specific questions or items that you maybe don't see covered here, let me know that and I can be prepared uh, for a week from Thursday to, to address those. First, just a quick uh, history and background. Many of you were around for the start of this program, but some of you are newer. Um, the program was established by council in November of 2018. Uh, throughout 2019, staff worked with council in developing a framework for the program. First year of construction um, from this program was in 2020. The program allocates $700,000 each year, and what that ends up equating to is roughly two blocks of street within each council district each year, roughly. Plus um, one for the council president. In the early years, yes, yes. Um, that was 
Yes, we can talk. We can get into all those details of the study session uh, when we when we wade into that. Yes. Council President didn't cede their budget to the others. <laughs> yes, and then um, again, that initial prioritization was uh, established in 2019. There was a minor update in 2021 um, with with council in terms of the locations. Um, just high clip, a reminder of what the program does is really seeking to, to take a real cost effective approach. And that means we're paving, strip paving only, 24 feet wide. Um, we do pave the alley, I'm, I'm sorry, the driveway approaches. If they have a paved driveway, we're going to pave the approaches to connect from the strip paving to their driveway. Uh, we generally handle drainage, just sheet flowing off to the side uh, with, a, with a shallow drainage ditch. We're looking at locations to avoid major utility impacts, uh, avoid utility structures, again, with that mindset of keeping the projects simple and keeping the costs down. Um, again, we look for areas that don't have major drainage issues. They need to be generally streets that aren't very steep because of that drainage issue. Um, and then also, of course, uh, you know, avoiding any kind of right of way or property impacts, again, to keep the costs down and keep the overall uh, process for the project. So the planning and design simple as well. Could you go back, please? Sure. Shallow V ditch for drainage. Does that mean it is paved or unpaved? This will show better. So it's unpaved. So that's really just those gravel areas off the shoulder of that strip mm -hmm. paving. We still have to deal with drainage. You want to make sure that by adding this impervious area, we don't create drainage problems right. out on right. the side. So that's what these, uh, what we're showing here. This is just a schematic plan, but some sort of a drainage ditch uh, type facility on each side of the road to deal with that runoff from the paved, paved street. And again, looking to try to avoid any drainage problems. And is, is the rock just the cheapest option? Is that why we, we use that instead of some sort of impervious concrete or some, some other material? Definitely, yeah. As soon as you get into any manufacturer type material, the costs are just gonna go through the roof. Yeah. But then that begs the question, where does the water go? It's going to the drainage ditch. It's going to seep into the ground. In some cases, if it has a little more grade, if it's getting to an intersection corner and there's inlets there, then, it's, then that can, can, can pick up that drainage or draw it in. Okay, I'm just concerned about impact of surrounding homes that may have issues with water running off of a paved surface. Sure, exactly. And that's why we're looking at those, okay. all those issues okay. to make sure we aren't creating a drainage problem. Is this kind, and Marlene might know too, This is this kind of what we did in front of um, Flett Middle School on Wellesley? Kinda? There was paving and then we had to put the drainage rocks down because of the houses there. Am I close? Was it a dirt road? Yeah, it definitely wasn't part of this program, but the right. end result is maybe similar. Okay. It just looks like it. Oh. Part of it. So back, back to kind of that screening and selection, the, the staff did an initial screening really at a very high clip GIS level to identify where all the unpaved streets were. Some of them were initially filtered out because they were in platted areas that had no development. There were old plats. You know, obviously there's no need to go pave a street when there's no development going on anywhere around it. So that 550 blocks was kind of that, after that initial screening, uh, we also excuse me, kind of categorize projects and try to prioritize based on their um, uh, proximity to centers and corridors or near schools and did essentially sort of some grouping of the different locations, then provided that list to city council and then from there, city council prioritized within those groupings uh, to provide the kind of the prioritization back to us. Again, that initial prioritization occurred in 2019. There was a minor update in 2021. Um, or certain districts, uh, the locations changed a little bit and others it didn't change at all. And then so the question is, you know, do we do, is there a need or do you want to do another update here in 2023? We still have the active list of priorities that you've provided back to me. I could continue just working down that priority list. They don't necessarily have to be updated. Just throwing that out there for consideration. Um, I'm assuming there might be interest from some since they asked to uh, kind of get a program mm -hmm. update. So, yes. Yeah, I would, I would love to review it and, and work with my, my seatmate to just see if there's agreement on sure. what makes sense. And that's what I assumed, and we can get into those, get down in the weeds more in the study session uh, next week as well and, and kind of talk about a few things. And what does 550 blocks translate to in miles? I'd have to go do the math. It's a lot. 
Yes. I, I want to say 60 miles, but I could be way off. Yeah, I mean, to put it, characterize it in a different way, just in terms of how long it takes, you know, we're only doing six blocks a year. So, so you do the math. And 100 years. None of us will be, be around okay. by the time they're done at the, at the current pace that yeah. we're working at, yes. So just uh, real quick, just summarizing the locations that have been completed to date or are planned here for 2023. And I'll note, I think, uh, I think the, the bid is on today's council agenda to award the 2023 locations. So 2020 uh, was a smaller program, did two blocks, so Napa Street um, in Northeast District or District 1. In 2021, the uh, design was kind of running late and, and we didn't feel like it could, could actually get constructed. It could have gotten out to bid, but we were uh, worried that the actual locations wouldn't get built in time in the fall of 21. So we ended up delaying it and packaging it together. So we really had two, I'll call them program years of 21 and 22 packaged together and built in 2022. So that's what you see, that second line item is really four blocks completed. There's a three block stretch on Lacey and Chief Gary neighborhood. And then that, uh, that high priority block on Sitka, that got done as well. And then the 2023 locations, again, it's a two block stretch, again, in Chief Gary, uh, Chief Gary Park, just south of the park. And that's a, just a quick map. I know it's hard to read, but uh, in your packet if you want, and uh, just gives you a feel for where they're at. And then District 2, a uh, little bit unique, we did a, that 2020 year was kind of a, a, a briefer year, and I'll get to the explanation as, as to why that was. But that first year in District 2 did Altamont Street, 46 to 49th, that is actually two blocks. The math isn't off, it's just the street names are such that there actually is no 47th Avenue in there. Uh, so it's a two block stretch. Um, 20, 44th Avenue Crestline to Altamont was a unique project for a variety of reasons. That was the uh, aforementioned uh, council president selection, but it was also a street that was currently, if you will, a local street, but was a planned future arterial. So we had to deal with it and approach it differently, and we bid that project separately. It's built with our future arterial street uh, uh, section. It's also built wide enough to accommodate bike lanes to kind of comply with our plans there. So that was a kind of unique standalone project that wasn't bid with the other uh, package of unpaved streets. And then the 2023 location this year is just adjacent to the 2022 location, uh, two blocks from Napa to Crestline. And again, that's the map of that district. And finally, District 3. So this is um, kind of some of the unique history. West Falls Avenue was constructed, not really part of this program, but as this program was kind of being developed, um, that is, West Falls is a street working down off Kendall Yards down towards the river. Uh, so that project was completed. Is it part of this program or not? I guess that's a matter of debate. We're listing it here. Um, but it did influence that initial 2020 of construction. We didn't do a 2020 project in light of the fact that West Falls had been completed a couple years earlier. So that 2022 program was smaller and didn't include a District 3 location. Um, the 2021-2022, this kind of highlights an issue that comes up, and I'll get into a lot more detail, a uh, study session of kind of those lessons learned and just challenges that we face. At the last minute, we ended up pulling out Lindica Street because of uh, just some coordination through developer services. Our understanding is that Kendall Yards needed to improve a water line and was going to do some improvements to Linda Key down the road. Obviously, it didn't make sense to build that strip paving and have it torn up. It was late in the game in our design process. It was too late to add another uh, location to the program and still get it out to bid into construction. So last year, we were essentially a block short in District 3. That's why we're doing three blocks this year in District 3 at the locations listed there. And again, a map of those. The District 3, three locations just happen to be more uh, spread around, if you will. So then back to the study session for next week. Just Wanted to give you a chance to digest that. Is there any other, any other information that um, might not be included in those bullet items that you'd like to discuss? Anything else for Kevin? Councilmember Bingo, anything? Silence. So we'll think of something right after you sit down. Okay, you can email me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next up is the Water Department Housekeeping Ordinance with Mr. Cyril, Catherine. I don't know if you're coming up too. Okay. This is this looks pretty simple. 
This should be a simple one. Yeah. This is simply a housekeeping uh, item. An update to the SMC ordinance uh, 1304. Uh, we found that um, we had removed the public fees from the SMC and put them into public rule. But in uh, the SMC, we actually link to the public rule. And that link was never updated. Mm. Um, that's actually listed in, uh, of course I would do that. That's in 1304-0608-2022. Uh, uh, and 2028. So within each of those, this would simply remove that link to the public rule. Questions? All right, you got off easy. Hey, excellent, thank you. Thank you. Fluoridation study and resolution. Catherine. Thank you, Jacoby. Uh, thank you, Council. So this is actually a two-part piece. I'll start with the first piece, which is uh, today was the official release of the non-project SEPA. That's a 14-day comment period that we have out in the community starting today. It'll go until midnight on June 5th. We will be taking the comments received and placing it into the study itself to have collected all the data uh, to date on the topic that we're doing for uh, uh, the study itself. Just off to the left real quick on the screen, that's the actual um, uh, advertisement in today's paper under the legal notices. And what you can't read it highlighted in yellow is the link to the project site, which is bolded in red right there. We're just gonna link on it real quick so people can see what it looks like when you click on that link or you dial it in in terms of type it in. It brings it to the study website and right down on the second page here, a second uh, topic, you can see the non-project SEPA. Those are the two buttons we are driving people towards. The first one, of course, being the SEPA document. Embedded in the SEPA document is all of the uh, um, instructions on how to comment, which is basically, again, telling them about the 14-day rule. And there are two ways to communicate any comments to the city. One is through our original address or email, or excuse me, address in terms of on, on uh, Spokane Falls Boulevard, as well as an email address. Uh, we can take comments through the email as well. And the SEPA course is about the draft study, which is the second link right below the first one. And so everything is combined right there. From there, I'll jump back to the presentation. Um, the second part is just talking about uh, the resolution itself. And uh, what we put forward was really a, a link between the resolution council had passed in 2022, it's uh, resolution 2022-0016. That was with the council and uh, the mayor talking about once the study is complete, there would be a second process, a process that would be public and transparent to decide what to do. So the resolution I'm referring to was just trying to lay down a line on the sand that the study is complete. It is not anything other than to acknowledge the completeness so that other resolution can move forward in terms of acknowledging. So that's why the intent behind uh, the resolution. So it doesn't accept or reject the study. It just merely explains or uh, explains as a council, you recognize the study is complete. So that was the intent behind it. Okay. Council President. Yeah, I, I don't know that we need to do um, another resolution. I'll just get a lot of people testifying on it, but I do wanted to follow up. I've been talking with our communications team about having some um, public meetings around it where you bring subject matter experts to the meeting to talk about it, get public comment. We're having a little bit of a debate within the council of should there be one in each district or just one big one. Um, so we're now that we have this, so we have something for people to respond to. That's great. But I don't know that, I mean, we've been clear that we were going to have this phase two public engagement. I think we're, I don't know that we have to have a resolution to do that. Sure, like I said, it was just a matter of understanding yep. when, when you all acknowledge it's done in terms of the yep. study is complete. So, go ahead. If, if you have, so there's a 14 day comment period, mm -hmm. um, which is recorded and will be part of this, right? Right. And then if we do, forums does it really matter i mean if people come out to to testify and share their thoughts and become informed it's not going to change anything in that 14-day study i mean what 
But the 14 day is a narrower process that we have to go through. It's, that doesn't define our process. That's just a requirement right. by the state, right? So SIPA, SIPA excuse me, states that uh, as early in the process as possible to communicate uh, any changes in your environment. And so uh, a study to understand costs is about as early as you can get in any process. And so this SIPA is a SIPA focused only on the study, okay. which is about coming up and understanding what it, what'll cost if okay. the city were to implement. So then that's different than what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. Okay, I just didn't and know if it was when you say clash. cost, it's not just cost to implement, but cost to continue to maintain. To, the it's, cost is the cost. Right, it's life cycle costs. Yes. So we really were trying to capture all costs so both uh, administration and council could understand okay. the entire impact of, of the decision. Go ahead. Well, I guess for the council president, so the forums that we're talking about, is that just forums regarding full implementation or is that over just the the, the report that we got back it I, I think it's anything okay that anyone wants to talk about yeah okay so I just the only thing I would say then is is if we're gonna have subject subject matter experts as part of that just to in, ensure that there's balance in terms of who's participating mm -hmm. Go ahead. and when are we getting a presentation on the actual study itself is so um, <laughs> if you have to go to the next slide real quick right. and uh, ignore the June 12th and 26th if council is not interested in a resolution. Uh, we are set up for June 15th for a study session. We will have council or the consulting group come in and answer any questions on the study in terms of how we came up with the costs or any kind of the process involved with uh, the study. Anybody so else? June 15th, right? Is that what you June said? 15th. Council President, you're not going to be there because you'll be in be in Albany. Albany. Okay. okay. Well, but I can watch on video. There we go. Any other questions for Catherine? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We are at the end of our agenda. It is two fifteen. So that's pretty darn good, I would say. And our next meeting is um, June. June, June, June. 26th. June 26th. So we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at 3.30.